everyone. I have a special treat for you today. We have the incomparable Mr. James Moses. Not many people know about Jim's Canadian roots, but up here we hold Jim so dear that if you look at our $5 bill, you will see his picture. I hope you enjoy Mr. James Moses, brought to you by Will Alexander's Dog Show Tips. Hi everybody, we're here with, uh, he doesn't need an uh, introduction, Mr. Jim Moses. Hi Jim, how are you? Good, good to see you, bro. Good to see you. How are you coping with all this uh, isolation? Yes. Well, I've been staying busy. I'm helping my daughter with her construction company and it keeps me busy, but I miss dog shows for sure. Yeah, me too. Well, yeah, thanks for joining us today, Jim. I have some questions for you, though. People are waiting to hear them. Can you start off and just tell me how you got involved with dogs and what age you were? Well, uh, my mother bred miniature poodles in, uh, in St. Catharines. And, uh, you know, I was always crazy about German Shepherds, and my dad got me one when I was nine. Nine, okay. And I haven't been without one since. So, so was it your dad that got you in it, or your mom obviously bred? Did she yeah. breed Joe Miniature Poodles? Yeah, but, you know, my dad know, knew that I was crazy about Shepherds, and we were building the motel when I was nine uh, down in uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina. And I... I saw there was some for sale, and I bugged him till he went and got me a puppy. <laughs> when did you start going to dog shows, Jim? Well, a couple of years later, I uh, worked with a guy by the name of Tom Harris. From he was uh, in, Air, in the Air Force and stationed up in uh, Niagara Falls area, and he was in uh, the canine unit. So I started working at his kennel and. You know, I worked for free just so I could be around the dogs, but I learned quite a bit about training. How old were you then? Oh, uh, 12. 12. <laughs> and uh, I, I finished my first dog uh, when I was 13. And uh, I believe it was 1965. That's when I was showing that uh, Shepherd for Heather Logan. She was Heather Norlander at the time. And, oh, this is up in Canada. Yeah, yeah. You know, we had top dog all breeds. There actually, <clears throat> I believe it was 65. Uh, I started showing in the States, but you needed a license. And uh, you had to be 21. And I started winning way too much. And uh, Ernest Loeb was a, a, a good shepherd friend of mine. I learned a tremendous amount from him. And uh, he said, you know, he said, you can't convince people you're not doing this for money. You can't show up with a six and eight dogs at a dog show and all owned by different people. <laughs> so, I mean, I, that's when I was about 17 or 18. So I went back up and showed in Canada for until I was 21. And, but right after I turned 21, they ended up discontinuing licenses. Oh, geez. Um, actually, while we're on the, the the topic of Canada, give us your your Canadian roots. Your, is your mom a Canadian? Yes. Yeah. She was from Sault Ste. Marie. She was French Canadian, and she and her sister married my father and his brother. Oh wow! Okay. So, but the majority of them moved from uh, when my mother was really young to St. Catharines. So you know, with it, where my dad was and my mother was, there's eight miles apart. But a river was yeah. in between them, so no big deal. I mean, I don't know if I'm Canadian or American. I was born on the U.S. side because by then my mother had moved over to this side, but the majority of my living relatives are all Canadian. You know, I used to know everybody there, but unfortunately it's the one bad thing about getting older is you lose all your friends. Oh, for sure. So yeah. you started showing in Canada then? before yeah, America? mostly. Well, I... I showed uh, the first few times really young. Here, I, I, my, the first shepherd I finished was in the States. Uh, or I might have finished him in Canada at the same time because I'd go back and forth. It didn't, wasn't much difference, you know. Mm -hmm. 
but I, I ended up just being too successful to stay under the radar. Uh, as far as that 21 year old having to have a license, sure. which it wasn't called for. And actually, shows were bigger on both sides of the border than they are today. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I'm just shocked at, at how our sport has dwindled so much, you know. And you think that's too many shows? I don't know. You know, it's lifestyle mainly. I mean, now I think that's some of the problem that we have with judges that don't have good animal sense. You know, years ago, even some of the terminology and standards, uh, you didn't have to explain that terminology to animal people, horse people, cattle people. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I mean, you know, uh, that goes back and forth in my mind about the quality of judges today versus the quality of judges we had 50 years ago. I mean, I see some of the names that when they're brought up, people claim how wonderful and smart they were. And they were some of the easiest judges to fool in my lifetime. Yeah. Well, I think once you're gone, people only remember the best about you. Let's hope so. Yeah, I mean, in my mind, you know, like the both Forsykes, Lang Scarda, Mike Billings, you know, those were the kind of people that really, in my my mind, deserved to, to go down as legends as far as judges were concerned. You could certainly start a good one under any of them, and they, they damn sure weren't going to miss it. You know, now that I judge quite a bit, I realize it's, not always what you see from outside the ring isn't what you get. You know, some dogs, you're pleasantly surprised. The closer you get to them, the more you like them. And unfortunately, it works the other way. Some really look good, and every step closer, you find a multiple little things wrong with them, you know? Mm. So you can sit outside the ring and think you're a know-it-all. It is different in there. Well, a completely different perspective. Um, a mentors, Jim. Who would you, who were some of your mentors over the years? Well, Lang Scarda. Ernest Loeb was my main. Actually, he and I went into partnerships when I was in my 20s, mm -hmm. my early 20s. And at that time, we were very profitable buying and selling dogs from Germany. The mark was like eight to one. Uh, we could buy a dog over there for 1500 and sell them for enough to buy a new Cadillac here. Wow. And, you know, I made substantially more money uh, buying and selling uh, good dogs than I did handling dogs. And you have to remember, back then it was rare that you'd have a Friday show. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually, even though I showed a lot of all breeds in Canada, I, when I first moved my operation back to the States, <clears throat> Uh, I didn't have a, 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 a bunch of friends, other hammers to count on to cover me. And uh, shepherd entries, uh, an average show would have 90 to 110 shepherds in it. So you, pretty much most of the day you were tied up. And I had dogs that I had one competitive at the, uh, the Canadian National Sportsman Show. And, you know, which Bob and Janie and all the big hammers would come up there every spring. Yeah. Well, I had judges that gave my dog groups and best in shows at those shows. And because I wasn't on them and had half, you know, not the greatest handlers covering for me because I was stuck in classes of 25 shepherds, they'd miss them in the breed altogether right in the classes. And I felt, well, I really wasn't being fair to them. And since the, the majority of my income, I was fine. It's the opposite today. I mean, I breed better dogs than I can find show homes for. And depending on the show home, uh, I, I prefer to uh, sell my puppies, you know, keep what we want for ourselves and put the rest in pet homes because they certainly have a much better life, you know. Yeah. You'd much rather get a photograph of this dogs sitting on a couch with three kids then some of these people taking them out of a run once every six months so that's true so you had Ernie Loeb as a mentor and you also Lang and Lang. were really good and I uh, had the good fortune to associate with good dog people mm -hmm. that we could openly discuss 
their dogs, my dogs. It was a completely different game back then. Well, it makes a huge difference. Yeah, yeah at, at every specialty show, there'd be 10, 12 handlers, and we had way more shepherd handlers at the time. I mean, now the entries are so small, you don't need 10 jockeys for a three-horse race. Exactly. They, they can't, you can't make a living in that breed anymore. If, But we'd go and discuss openly, uh, criticize each other's dog, but constructively. Yes. If you dare say 10% of that today, you wouldn't have anybody that talked to you. Well, that's what I enjoyed the most about the sportsman show that you were chatting about, is, is we, we, we had to stay there all day, so we all talked. It was, it was yeah. Great. I was a kid, but I got to see all you guys. So. Yeah. And because, you know, no dog is perfect, and if somebody mentioned to you where they might would like to see the dog a little stronger, you didn't feel like you were being accused of catching a social disease at a bar. Today, <laughs> you can't. You have to be careful even in the ring, you know. I just don't even venture uh, my opinion unless somebody really asks me. Yeah. I, you know, there's always two ways to look at any any dog. You know, you can discuss the good points or the bad, and they all have both. Oh, no question. You know, even if a dog is really not very good quality, and especially with newer people, I try to point out one or two nice things about the dog before I point out the, the things that need improvement. Even if they need to save their money with that one, you know, you try to feel them out if they're really interested in the sport and want to continue, then I always advise them, you know, the money they spend in entry fees on this when they can get a good one. But yeah, you do have to be careful. You don't want to discourage them. Oh, exactly. Especially nowadays, it's yeah. hard to get them here. So obviously the Shepherds is your favorite breed. Yeah, sure. Do you have a favorite dog? I'm sure you have a That's, lot. I, you know, they all have a special place in my heart because they all had their unique, unique things about them. Like, Take Captain Crunch, for instance. He was so ball crazy. I mean, he was absolutely, you just couldn't believe it. And I'd always keep several half-deflated basketballs around because he was a strong dog, <laughs> you know. Uh, and in the middle of the night, he'd get bored and come and push me, he'd grab it and push me a little bit. And I'd give him a whack to him and leave me alone. And he knew he'd get in trouble, but finally he just couldn't contain himself. He put his front feet on the bed and whacked me as hard as he could with that <laughs> deflated uh, basketball. Then he'd run like cow because he knew I was going to go after him. But he, he just couldn't resist it. Manhattan had a gifted upbringing. And Manhattan had a tremendous character and personality. But all I did is a few fine things with him. But that dog had a gifted upbringing. You know, Custom Made was a dog that I really liked as far as his personality and oh. He was kind of green in a lot of areas, but he loved you so much he'd do his damnedest to overcome any of his problems. So, you know, every dog had different things. Oh, sure. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Um, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I mean, you, don't even, you don't even have to answer this, or you could answer the way most of us would answer it. Um, if you were judging those dogs, your famous dogs of the past, which one would you put up? <laughs> uh, a lot of them were really, really, really good dogs. And yeah. I did some winning with some that weren't quite so good, you know. Uh, that That's a difficult question. Uh, some would depend on ringside and the type of, of, of show we were at. If you want to talk about a breeder, just an absolute breeder show, I would imagine that Mystique, of course, was, was really a good one. Uh, she had a lot of bad luck at nationals, and she was runner-up, I think, three or four years in a row. Wow. And the one year I I, I could have won it with her, uh, Peggy Douglas, she's passed now, was a good friend of Lang Scarter, so it was a breeder judge from Texas, loved her to death. But I was trying to see how many best in shows I could get in one year and I wanted to get 120 and Mystique only got to get 118 but I skipped a national she and that was one of the poorer years as far as quality was 
she was so mad at me. She wouldn't talk to me for a year and a half or two years, but she loved me enough that she got over it, but she was livid. But, you know, one time before I bought Mystique, the guy that was handling her, they judged males first. He went Grand Victor with a male because they finish males and you either won best male. So you'll be the Grand Victor whether you're best to breed or best opposite. Then he comes in with Mystique and ends up getting second. Just she had nothing but bad luck there. The year I showed her, Ralph Roberts judged, and Ralph loved her. I mean, he would never beat her. His daughter bugged her because she was five and a half, and we had not bred her. We were showing her. And Ralph told me later, he said, oh, well, he put a young class bitch, best opposite, and put her, you know, there's a hundred and some specials there always, and give her select two. It said, wow, she hasn't had babies, and this is a national. You're supposed to do this for a breeding. Just, you know, as I say, she had bad luck. Yeah. So we didn't really get an answer there, but we'll... Uh, we'll uh... Right, I was, you know, I, I picked a couple of my favorite males as, as far as uh, coming the closest to the standard. Yeah. Uh, Captain Crunch was beautiful. He had a little bit of a tight coat. Uh, that was Mystique's advantage. She carried a tremendous amount of undercoat, and she appealed to... Uh, a lot of the Tory judges, the non-sporting judges, were a shepherd like Captain Crunch did not. But he sure appealed to herding and working dog judges because he was beautifully structured and a great mover. Well, I remember, I think you had him at the Blue Water Show one year. I don't know if you were showing him, but you had him up there, and you made me watch him in the field. You had someone running him, and uh, he, was, he was crazy. He was unbelievable. So. Yeah. And that was a, just a great structured dog, you know, with a great mind, too. That always helps, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, what was your most what was your most exciting win? Your your favorite win, Jim? Well, I would like to say win in the garden, but that wasn't. That was like a relief. Oh yeah. You have a dog, top dog, all breeds for three years and keep getting nipped at the wire. Uh, and the dog was up there; he was almost eight. I uh, said. So, that, that was with Manhattan. That was a relief yeah, yeah. not to have to retire him. And, you know. So, But that's another dog show like any other one, you know. Uh, one of my disappointments was, you know, I, at most of the shows in the country, the important ones, I've, I've had a best in show at. The one show I never did get best in show at was Old Dominion. And three or four times, the dog I'd get beat by at Old Dominion Within the next six weeks, I beat under the same best in show judge after that. <laughs> Not good luck, you know. That was my favorite show when I was a kid. Outdoor show. It was all yeah. Me too. But. Uh, funniest thing to happen to you in the ring, Jim? Well, it wasn't funny at the time, but I've knocked myself out a few times. How'd you do that? <clears throat> I forget where there were, You know, years ago, we showed in so many of them armories. Right. Well, there was an armory. Maybe it was Albany, New York, one of those. And I guess I was in my mid twenties. And our it was a small armory for the size of the show. So uh, some of the rings were set up to where the back wall would be one end of the ring, and uh, the beams that were coming up were a little bit of an angle from the wall. Well, we got whipping around there, and I ran right into one of them. I woke up about 10 minutes later. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, I've had some experiences, though, you know, that. Do you, you still have any goals in this sport? <clears throat> well, I'm pursuing my judging career now. I have five and a half groups, and uh, I, have, uh, I have half of sporting and I have a couple of hound breeds, but most of hounds to go. And, uh, you know, this has been my whole life. So and that's one way for me to stay involved and see my friends. And, you know, I want to just keep gaining knowledge and, and uh, you know, hopefully I'll, when I do, after retire from judging, I'll have a good reputation for being a straight shooter and calling it the way I see it, you know. That's all you can do, really, Jim. Um, and on the same topic of judges, 
um, any advice for, um, I don't know how I can put this. How about the system, the way they have the system now, Jim? What do you think of that? The judges you mean have the license? Pardon me? The, for, you mean how they license people? Right, right. I, I don't think there's ever going to be a real fair way to do that. Uh, I'm not, Tim and, and the rest of them keep doing their best, but you know, in so many instances, you treat, if this were a hospital, you treat the janitor the same way you do a brain surgeon. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, you have the same rules, regulations, timetables, uh, no matter where you are, your experience in the breed, what I think they're starting to do now is slowing down people going forward, but uh, the people that spend their whole life in dogs, it is, it's still a very slow process. And, you know, a few times people have asked me, oh, is your goal to be an Aubrey judge? It's not a goal or some big thing because I've always felt for years, a lot of our Aubrey judges, even years past, they were Aubrey judges because they were unsuccessful in anything else in dogs. I mean, who starts judging when you're 28 or 30 if you're breeding a bunch of winners, if you're handling a bunch of winners? Mm -hmm. Think about it. Oh, well, that makes sense. And with, yeah. the, with the system in the States especially, as slow as it is, for you to gain Aubrey status, it takes years and years and years to do that. Uh, that's why so many of our good professionals looked at the requirements even after they spent 50, 60 years in dogs and see what they have to go through. They said, oh, well, then I'm not doing it. Where if you're not very successful in your breeding program, and, and you and I both know there's so many breeds, you can breed your required champions and put your 10 years in and just defeat your own dogs from your own litters. Yeah. And it's the same requirements. And if you know, if you have a little bit of money, that doesn't hurt to attend some of the seminars and that. And there's no substitute for hands-on experience. And I mean, I can name you that. And it's, we've had some big winners that didn't make good dog judges. But when I say big winning handlers, they might have I've had one or two big winners. And sometimes luck plays a part. Oh, but, any, but any of these handlers that year after year after year, they come out with a good one. I promise you, those are good dog people. They didn't; Those dogs didn't just show up at their door looking like they should be best in show at the garden. Right. Or that they wouldn't be showing up at his door. <laughs> now, you got to find them in the middle of the line or towards the end and realize with a little grooming, a little training, a little different style. I mean, even when I said I, I bought and sold dogs from Germany, I couldn't go to the front of the line and think you're going to make any money because all the Japanese, China, everybody would be there buying the winners. I had to find good dogs that that particular judge missed for different reasons. Yeah. And understand, figure out, could I make chicken salad out of chicken shit? And, that, <laughs> and that's where I made my money. Yeah. I... Made a few lemons too, boy, and had a drink <laughs> lemonade. I can tell you that too. So that's how you learn. If you don't eat for a while because of your mistakes, you learn them. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, what about uh, advice for new handlers, Jim? What, do you what would you tell them? I would tell them to work for the best handler they could for a while. Uh, you know, we have way too many people today. They have a station wagon or a van and a leash and a brush and now they're handlers. Way they go. I mean, you know, even when I was handling, it pained me to watch anybody else show one of my dogs. But with that being said, my good shepherd friends would point little things out I was doing wrong. You can always stand outside the ring and and that's something handlers did way more in days gone by. Yeah. Is help each other. For, and I'm not saying all of the handlers today. We have plenty of handlers that help each other. But you know yourself as a handler. You could see things that maybe I should be doing different if you're getting more of a perspective of what a judge is seeing than I could grade up on top of a oh, dog. Sure. Vice versa. 
Yeah. Uh, you, you know, and when I say a, a good handler, I'm talking about an honorable one, too. That, you know, it's unfortunate in the sport, but most people, handlers included, think judges are good because they usually end up at the front of the line more than they do the middle of the line. And you're, you're going to be spinning your wheels. You really need to know what judges know and what doesn't. Uh, if you're going to start a really good hot young dog, you want to take them to people that's not going to say, well, I've given you a couple of groups the last couple of times I've seen you. You don't need to win now. You need somebody that's going to know those dogs to get them started. And, you know, and a good handler teaches their, their uh, uh, assistants those things. They don't lead them into believe it's all about people's faces. I mean, the only judges that really have to pay that much attention to faces are the ones that lack knowledge. I mean, there's plenty of friends I've had for 40 years, and I've yet to be able to really reward them, and it breaks my heart. But the dogs tell you what you have to do to the best of your knowledge. Sure. What past do dog show person uh, do you miss the most, Jim? Lang Scarda. Lang. Tell me a bit about Lang. You talked about Ernie a bit. What was Lang like to, to mentor under? He had a great sense of humor. And back in those days, if they had a really good friend and somebody was sick and they had to maybe put the third dog uh, to the front of the line, you know, they knew me well enough that that they they would say things maybe they wouldn't say to the average person, you know? Mm -hmm. But uh, Lang had such a sense of humor. Uh, er Ernie was one of his best friends, and he bought quite a few dogs from Ernie. I mean, Lang was a shepherd person. Even though he was a very respected Aubrey judge, he was a shepherd person. Oh, we used to see him up here a lot. And he, he beat a few of Ernie's famous dogs. And what he would do is... He'd mark his buck when it was over, and he wouldn't come out the entrance because Ernie would be waiting for him. He'd go out and jump the ropes and holler to Ernie. He said, I'll catch you later when you cool down. <laughs> and, I mean, Lane would do what he, what he needed to do, you know. And uh, he had such a personality, you couldn't stay mad at him. <laughs> well, yeah, we enjoyed him when he was up here, that's for sure. Yeah. Superstitions. Any superstitions? None. No, that's a good thing, especially for a handler. Wow. No. I'll tell you one of the smartest things I learned as a handler when I was young. I had another good friend, a Hungarian by the name of uh, Joseph Bahari. And he, he, he uh, had a boarding and breeding kennel up in Smithtown, New York. Uh, I had a bitch that, uh, for whatever reason, she did not like the flash of the camera. I mean, a beautiful bitch. And uh, he helped me, you know, figure out some ways to trick her. And uh, finally he got mad at me because I started to give up on this bitch. And then he said to me in his broken English, he said, who's smarter, you or that damn dog? You know, he was the type of guy that, <clears throat> he's, he's the hammer that when Dougie was showing that terrier, Joe was wasn't able to handle it anymore, but he was double handling that shepherd and knocked the table over right inside the next ring. He ran right through the next ring. Oh Jesus! Yeah, <laughs> down in, at those shows in Oneonta, but he was aggressive. Uh, but that stuck with me for quite a while, you know. And you can't force a dog to do anything because you don't get a good end result. I mean, they may do it, but they're not doing it happy. So right. I always thought about. How can I trick this dog to do something I wanted him to do, not force him to do it? And that's helped me out of a lot of problems I've had with dogs over the years. I'd pay attention, to, you know, to that. And actually, Joe was such an aggressive dog man, as Brumby called him in one time. At that time, he, he uh, for double handling. Back then in the States, they were way more crazy about it than they are today. But uh, Joe had... He had a wit to him, but he said to Len, he said, well, tell me, he said, if I can get a picture of my dog, he said, I can call him for the picture, right? And Brumby said, well, of course. 
Then Joe said, well, if I don't call him, I'll never get to get the picture. So <laughs> yeah. I'm being up just throwing him out. He said, you're hopeless, you know. <laughs> but those are the people I, I grew up in dogs with that had good senses of humor. They were true dog men, you know. Yeah, oh, for sure. All right. Um, any obstacles you've had to overcome, Jim? I'm sorry? Any obstacles you've had to overcome? In, in handling or judging or what? Uh, either. Give us just an incident or something. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the problems with uh, handling a lot of good dogs that were competitive is it's <clears throat> constant pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, I might say constant. You know, uh, I'm a little self-driven myself which I think you need to be pretty competitive if you want to, uh, for quite a few years now, we've had a lot of competitive people. Mm -hmm. uh, if you fall asleep, you get passed by pretty quick. And uh, that's the only thing I don't miss about showing dogs, you know, is uh, always trying to be number one in whatever you're doing, you know. Uh, after I, you know, once in a while, it's just nice to be able to take a weekend off and go fishing. I resent the times, you know, all the time I was growing up, my dad take me up to North Bay and Lake Nipissing and all that fishing. And then for five years before he died, each year I'd have something hot. I was running for top herding dog or top this or top that. And I kept postponing him for, I'd tell him next year till I lost him. I mean, I would certainly do that again. I'm glad uh, all of my assistants, their ex-assistants now, every one of them are great to their children. I mean, they miss a weekend for graduation. They they don't care. I mean, that's very important. And if I could do anything different in my lifetime, uh, I would certainly would have spent more time with my kids and not be driven for, for, for all this stuff. Well, that's a good note. I think we should actually end it on that one. That's a good note. I really appreciate your time, Jim. I'm glad you put this aside for us. I hope all is well out there. And you're in, where are you right now? Uh, Alpharetta, Georgia. Georgia. Yeah. And uh, when's the next time you're going to the farm? Uh, maybe in two days. I have some equipment to move and stuff, so I've been been running around. I just came back in four-day big triangle, you know? Yeah. I mean, I was scheduled to judge like well over 100 shows this year. I think 108 or 10, something like that, before Corona. And I just couldn't keep two businesses going at the same time. Uh, I couldn't. You can't run a business and be gone that many days when you add travel days into it, you know? Yeah, no, for sure. So I have pretty much accomplished what I wanted to as far as breeding deer. And, you know, dog breeding really helped me. Oh, sure. Uh, go places in that particular industry pretty fast, you know. Okay. I appreciate your time again, Jim. Thanks, Jim. That was great. We really enjoyed that. I hope uh, you all took a look at that $5 bill and saw Jim and noticed the resemblance. Anyway, if you like what we're doing here, make sure you press like, share, and subscribe, and press that notification bell as well. You want to send me some messages, send it to dogshowtips at gmail.com, or I'll take a look at our website, willalexander.net. And uh, thanks for coming by again. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye now.